there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tephalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tephalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters. Today we bring you an interview with John Kalman. John is a principal lecturer in the Department of English and Language Studies at Canterbury Christchurch University in England. John lectures on subjects such as group communication, intercultural communication and intercultural training, as well as course design and materials and task evaluation. He is also involved in teacher training in Malaysia and has held consultancy positions in Saudi Arabia, Argentina and Poland, amongst other countries. John's published works include Intercultural Communication, an advanced resource book for students, co-authored with Adrian Holiday and Martin Hyde. In this interview, Rob discusses ELT course books with John and how to treat them critically, amongst other related topics. Okay, so this is Rob and I'm here with John Coleman at Canterbury Christchurch University. Uh, thank you for joining me. You're welcome, Rob. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, could you uh, just talk a little bit about your background as a teacher and as a researcher? My first real experience was actually teaching ESL um, in Leicester um, during, during that year, teacher training year. So, um, I then went on and did a bit of ESL teaching um, and also teaching of literature, did, did teaching in a number of state schools. Uh, and then I went into uh, teaching adult learners. Um, and I was at a private language school in the UK. Uh, I worked there for a number of years and became director of studies. Um, I did an MA at Christchurch um, in 1987 and then I came back to Christchurch in 91 and have been here ever since. Wow. (laughs) So um, I've been based in Canterbury but done a lot of work overseas, particularly in Malaysia, uh, where I worked for three years uh, on Bia Tessel uh, programs and have got very close links with Malaysia but also uh, parts of uh, Poland, Hungary, France, uh, Latin America, uh, parts of the Middle East. Um, so had, I've had a lot of experience in different countries but, uh, over the years. Um, so your PhD thesis was on the social construction of learner identity in uh, UK, the UK published ELT course book. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you get interested in that area? I think there were three experiences I had. I remember my first experience of teaching ESL in a language unit in a uh, Leicester comprehensive school. Um, and I was asked to use a book called Practice and Progress by Louis Alexander, which was a sort of bestseller back in the late 70s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I went in my first lesson, I realised that this was not what the kids needed because there were recently arrived immigrants to the UK, and at the end of the lesson, one of them came up and said he had to go to the doctor with his father <laughs> that afternoon, and you know, want to ask me about some words and some language and these type of issues. And I I realised very quickly that the type of book which I'd been asked to use by the school was completely unsuitable. Not so much partly from a language perspective, but mostly from a socio-cultural perspective. So that was a very early experience. And I remember having to go down and getting a whole lot of realia, no computers in those days to download stuff, but picking up leaflets and going to doctor's surgeries and picking up forms and, and basing lessons around that. So I think that was a very early experience where I, I, I realised that the, the course book was not necessarily going to be socio-culturally useful uh, or appropriate for my learners. Uh, the second experience I had in the early 90s, uh, we were involved in projects, British government funded projects in Poland um, and Hungary. And I remember going to a language, new language institute, teacher training institute for English language teachers, just on the Ukrainian border of Poland. And 
we were there to advise and do some teaching and help the help the, the teacher trainers and one day I said would you like to see our library so I said yes yeah, be very interesting so we went downstairs into the basement and there were racks and racks and racks of UK and US published English language textbooks including books like Headway at the time and they obviously hadn't been touched, they were pristine, in pristine condition. And I said to the uh, teacher educator who was with me, I said, oh, they don't seem to have been used. And she said, no, she said, because that, it's very depressing for my learners. They open up and it's all about planning a holiday in the US. And a lot of, a lot of kids in Poland cannot, cannot afford to go to the, to the mountains down the road for a weekend. I mean, so there's a, this lifestyle which is presented in the, in the textbook um, is, you know, miles away from the reality of my learners. So that was a second experience. Third experience I had was when we had a British government project. Um, again, it was actually, I think, just in the mid-90s, and I remember it because uh, while we, the teachers were here from South Africa, Mandela was elected. These were teachers from townships such as Soweto, and they brought over um, textbooks with them. And they said, oh, would you like to see the textbooks that we're using in secondary schools in South Africa? And I looked at them, and they were a British publisher, and they had the most bizarre content. There was one unit about the dam busters. Uh, there was another unit about um, the Crusades. And not only that, there was also anybody, it was, there was no photographs, but there were pen and ink drawings in the textbook. Uh, and black people were represented as very primitive, uh, often carrying spears with loincloths. Uh, people who were white were police officers or teachers or, you know, people in authority. And so... Those three experiences, I think, got me really interested in this. Um, and I started realising that um, a lot of teachers in different parts of the world, you know, are sometimes being forced to use textbooks published in the UK or the US and don't really have much choice about the matter. And also the content of these, you know, is the approach is highly questionable. On mm. the textbooks. It reminds me of uh, what uh, Kangaraja says about mm. the textbooks that uh, the students are using in being like focused on British life and yeah. you know, completely yeah. removed from their reality. Yeah, I mean, Kangaraja's work is interesting because he also talks about how the learners try to subvert the textbook mm. by sort of writing the textbook and comments. And I think, you know, it, it's you have to be careful about saying this textbook is that or this textbook is that. Obviously, it depends on how the teacher uses it. But this is an, another point, that a lot of the teachers... Um, were not using these very critically, particularly I found teachers in the UK. Um, and I would include probably myself in that. When I first started teaching, you're trying to get through the lesson, you've you've got a you've got a course book, you're thinking about your planning, your training teaches you to, if you like, make sure that you've got good tasks and you've got uh, you know integrative skills and communicative activities and all of these types of things but actually <coughs> uh, there's two little thoughts maybe about first of all what is the focus of those activities and also what we're asking learners to talk about and what in which ways we're asking them to talk about these things so um, I think it really it really became a key issue for me and I mean I my first degree was mostly in literature it was English language and literature but that literature background had also given me that sort of critical edge of looking at uh, literature but then applying it to textbooks as well um, so I think you know teachers pick up textbooks um, and they don't really look at them critically as they would at a possibly a newspaper or uh, some other published material a textbook seems to be somehow not considered in the same way as any other cultural artifact and I think this is this is something which has been 
uh, a gap generally when we're looking at materials evaluation. It has been mentioned by a number of people, but it hasn't taken a very sort of major part in textbook evaluation. Mm. So, well, I know that there's been quite a lot of focus on, um, on gender representation yeah. in textbooks, um, but you have a, a chapter in a recent book called Critical Perspectives on Language Teaching Materials. Um, and in your chapter, you note that there have been few in-depth explorations of why the coursework is as it uh, is, as it is uh, or of possible links between coursebook content and broader changing cultural, historical and socio-political systems of relations. Mm -hmm. So given the prominent place of the coursebook in ELT, why do you think that is? Why do you think there hasn't been that, that much focus? I think there's a number of reasons. First of all, um, a textbook needs to sell, and a, a, an international, a, a course book for the global market published in the UK or the US or Australia or a, another uh, you know, country um, would generally the aim is to sell the textbook. Now, sometimes those textbooks are produced, um, from my perspective, in quite a narrow way. I mean, I remember going to talk to a publisher about a textbook many years ago, a textbook which was produced for teenagers, global textbook. And I asked the publisher, um, you know, where do you get your ideas? Where does the writer get the ideas from? Um, and they said, well, what we do, we send, um, we sent teenagers out onto the streets of this particular city, and we got them to talk about the things they were interested in, what they talked about, and these type of things, which in some ways is very good. But then I'm sort of thinking, well, actually, that's, that's British teenagers, okay? They're often the kids of people who worked at the particular publisher um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that these topics and the way you talk about these things is necessarily are necessarily going to be appropriate for the global textbook so I think that's one factor um, I think another factor is also that the selling factor is an important one I remember talking to a textbook writer when I was doing my PhD research and this textbook writer had talked about how important it was, human rights and a liberal outlook uh, coming through the textbook. And it was a long interview, it was about an hour or so, and, and later in the interview he was talking about writing a version of a textbook for a particular country in the Middle East. And he actually said in the interview, I wouldn't dream of having a black face in it. Mm. And I was beginning to think, well, because it wouldn't sell. Now, I found, that, I found that interesting because, you know, on the one hand in the interview, you've got someone talking about liberal values and human rights. And on the other hand, there's the commercial pressure. So I think commercial pressures also play a part. Um, sometimes feedback, I think today a lot more feedback is given but the feedback, generally speaking, from my experience, textbooks, feedback is given by teachers rather than learners often. Okay? So how far learners are actually involved in uh, giving feedback, I'm not sure. Um, again, my research on this was some years ago and things will have changed, I'm sure. Okay? And it may well be that the marketing strategies of major publishers um, do are far more sophisticated today. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say about what's happening today, but I can just say what I found when I was doing my PhD research, which was back uh, you know, in the early 2000s. Mm. Gender. Um, a lot of the early research tends to be content analysis, so it was counting how many people in positions of authority were male or female. And then you had some textbooks which, you know, interestingly, I remember I think it was co-build textbook had one unit which all the people in positions of power were actually female and I think this was quite interesting. I think you have to you have to differentiate between how people are represented in textbooks and what happens in the classroom and I have a very vivid memory of going to observe one of our master's students giving a lesson in a private language institute 
Um, and the lesson was on gender with a high intermediate class. And there were some very good materials being used. But then, in a mixed gender class sort of 16, 17 year olds, it was the males who completely dominated the class and all the activities. And so I began to think, well, it's not actually just what is in the textbook, it's how these things are used. And I had a very interesting discussion with the teacher after the lesson. I said, this very interesting lesson, you have some very interesting tasks. But did you observe, did you see how, who, who was dominating the tasks? And then we had a very interesting discussion about how it's not just what is in the materials, it's how you use them as a teacher. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it reminds me of my own experience of teaching... Uh, so I taught at one university in Japan, which uh, the class was mostly boys, and they were very loud, and yeah. you know they, you know they were arguing and that kind of thing. Um, and then I taught at uh, a place where the classes were all mixed, uh, and in those classes the boys tended to dominate, or the, uh, and the female students tended to not to be so so yeah. loud. And now I teach at a women's university, and the classes are really loud and arguing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I guess it's it's how you manage the classes yeah, and so on. Yeah. So I mean, it's not just it's not just the textbook, but it's how how the textbook is sort of activated in the in the classroom. Um, and sometimes you can have so you you can deliberately te choose texts which are provocative to try and try and get um, discussion going. Mm. My worry today is that, and I think this is reflected by a number of people, is that. Generally speaking, topics are very safe, mm. extremely safe. No, nothing political um, is talked about. I mean, I remember when I first started teaching, I remember in the late 70s, there was a book called Colonel Plus, which was a big, big textbook. It was Colonel Intermediate and Colonel Plus. And Colonel Plus has some pretty heavy topics in it, like nuclear power, is TV good or bad for us, and these type of things. They're pretty heavy. And certainly they're a bit dull, <laughs> both for teachers and students, unless, unless you sort of found some way of um, making them interesting. But I sort of, this is a big question about the English language teacher. I mean, even if you don't realise it, you are an educator more generally, rather than just an EFL teacher or ESL teacher. And basically, um, you know, that value system, even if you don't realise it, is going to come through. Uh, and your value system is going to be reflected in the materials you use, and particularly how you use them. So I think it's, it's a complex area. But I, I would say one of the criticisms today is that textbooks tend to be a bit like bite-sized chunks. I remember one textbook writer telling me in an interview that it's a bit like an in-flight magazine. Mm. There's nothing offensive uh, or possibly could possibly be offensive. There's, there's a lot of colour, short articles, mm. bite-sized chunks. And I found some reaction from students to that particularly young, you know, adult students. And I remember, I remember one student, and I tried some activities out from a textbook, and I remember a Swedish teacher who actually said to me, this is puerile. Mm. Just because we're learning English doesn't mean that we just want to talk about, you know, stupid puerile things. There are, we want to talk about things which are important to us. Now, so this idea of the safety of the textbook, you know, it's become, in a sense, very sanitised. Mm. It's like the in-flight magazine. Is that connected, do you think, to the idea of the, the parsnips in, in publishing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the parsnip, you know, I was told this by a course book writer, um, that there was a acronym at the time, and again, we're going back some time, and that was P-A-R... S N I P, and this was an acronym which, which meant that you couldn't include. First one was politics, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, isms, 
<laughs> such as communism, fundamentalism, or pork was the last one. Mm. Interestingly, I, when I was doing my research, I tried to get publishers' guidelines. I wrote to all the major publishers, and I asked them if they would share guidelines with me for mm. textbook writers on cultural content. None of them would. <laughs> I see. Uh, in fact, only one publisher agreed to talk to me. Oh, okay. So they're quite kind of keeping so their cards close to their chest. Very close to their chest, yeah. Um, when I was doing research, part of my research was talking to textbook writers as well as analysing the textbooks. So I went for a number of years to conferences, mostly IOTEFL, because at IOTEFL you, you have textbook writers who are often introducing new textbooks. And I remember one, and I used to go to the presentation, and then I'd often go and ask the textbook writer if they would do an interview. Mm -hmm. Um, it was quite interesting one occasion because there was a presentation by a major publisher and the textbook writer and I went to the uh, presentation and after the presentation I went up and asked the textbook writer if, if he would be interested in doing an interview and he said yeah sure one of the publishing staff overheard this I explained what the interview was about and one of the publishing staff actually said, no, you can't do an interview to him. And he was extremely angry about that, actually, right. because he felt that, you know, why, you know, it's being censored. I mean, why, why shouldn't he give an interview to me? So it, right. sort of, it sort of suggests that there is a great sensitivity about, you know, the discussion mm. of cultural appropriacy in teaching materials. Right, right, right. Yeah, it, um, again, it reminds me a little bit of when I was uh, doing my CELTA course, uh, and I put, I was making groups, you know, um, and I put together uh, a Muslim man and a Muslim woman, mm -hmm. just, I didn't think about it, I put them yeah. together, and I got marked down mm -hmm. for cultural insensitivity. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a problem working together, mm -hmm. but they could have had, mm -hmm. and that was enough to... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, so, maybe speaking about your PhD work yeah. a little bit, um, you analysed textbooks from 1971 to 1999, yeah. um, and you've done a subsequent uh, study of the Speak Out textbooks, I think? Yeah, I've done a bit, a bit more extended research um, onto that and looked at more recent materials. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the aim of that was to examine discourses of identity in global yeah. reality course books. Yeah. Um, so, what's the relationship between textbooks or course books uh, that are produced for a global market and the personal identity of learners. Yeah, I mean, obviously, identity is a huge area. Mm. Uh, and when I did the PhD, I had to get into all the literature on identity and cultural identity. Um, I suppose if you're looking at identity, then such things, I'll give you a simple example to start off with. You may have a textbook which talks about personal qualities or personal characteristics. And sometimes, um, I mean, it's quite interesting, there's, there's one textbook which I used to use, which actually was good because it had, you started off by looking, you had a grid and you had opposites, so you had such things as cautious, spontaneous, etc, etc. And some of these, you then had to put these in a grid, so you had opposites. And the students then had to discuss where they were mm -hmm. in terms of these personality characteristics. Later on in the unit, it actually became quite interesting because it started talking about you know culture and how, <laughs> how different qualities are um, you know seen as positive or negative in different kinds. When I gave this activity, it's quite interesting. I, mean, I gave it I gave it to I've given it to a number of groups um, and we've actually discussed it from a critical perspective. Now that textbook was actually good because it gave it gave the other point of view. But quite a lot of textbooks that you're looking at the type of adjectives which are used to describe personality. And sometimes when you're looking at the, the textbook today, uh, the sort of individuals who are presented there are sort of somehow 
all achieving, <laughs> uh, highly motivated, assertive. Okay, they're, they're somehow these sort of superheroes in a sense. Uh, now, so when you were looking at identity, there is a lot of textbooks start off by getting students to talk about themselves, which I'm all very happy about, okay? because I think a lot of textbooks didn't in the past. So talking about yourself, but talking about yourself is a highly contextual uh, issue, because mm. how do you introduce yourself? Um, what do you say about yourself? Do you introduce yourself? Okay. What are all the factors which go into how you present yourself and how you define yourself? Mm. All of these issues. And all of these issues have come very directly into the textbook because today I think one of my conclusions was that the textbook has become very eye-centred. Mm. So, Learners, if you, if you go right through a textbook and you look at all the different activities, all the different things that learners are asked to say about themselves and about their families, but particularly about themselves, it's quite incredible. There's a lot of stuff which I wouldn't want to share mm. <laughs> with anybody who wasn't a close friend or relative. And when I did an analysis, I went through and I found some amazing things in textbooks. For example, Describe your first kiss was mm. one of the activities. Right, right. Another one was, have you ever slept in a double bed, for example? <laughs> um, there was another one to, can you tell me about a scar that you have? Mm. Okay. Right. So some of these sort of <laughs> some of these questions. Uh, now, of course, a learner can doesn't have to answer. Mm. But you are being channelled down a particular route. You're being channelled to talk about your identity in particular ways. Right, right. So, I went into a lot of work. I mean, I was quite interested in work by social psychologists such as Margaret Wetherill and Jonathan Potter, who'd done a lot of work about how people talk about other people particularly research in New Zealand. Mm. Um, I was also very interested in the work of James G, who t who's talks about discourse and how discourse with a big D is also how you present yourself. It, it's not just sort of analysing the micro you know, micro language, if you like, is looking at how language links with identity. So James G was very influential in mm. to me. I also was very interested in social constructionism, and I got very interested in that. Um, and I started thinking about how the world is divided up, and how Vivian Burr's book on social constructionism was very influential on me, actually, um, because, you know, it looked at how you know, there's no such thing as reality at the, at the, at the extreme level of social constructions and there's only, there's only ways of seeing and the way in which the world is divided up and how we talk about ourselves and other people is based very much on you know, cultural models, what, mm. what uh, James G would talk about cultural models. So there was a whole range of perspectives that I looked at, so cross, what's called cross-cultural psychology as well. And, and looking, for example, at emotions and not just, you know, the, the, the fact that there are certain universal emotions expressed in language, but how the, the point is that there is, in the textbook, it seems to me that context is missed out. So, you know, you, you, you are asked to be, I remember the one wonderful unit in Blueprint, which was a UK published textbook in the late 80s, I guess it was, in some ways a very good textbook. And it had a unit on, are you assertive? And you had to do a questionnaire, a bit like a popular magazine, and you had to ask these questions. At the end, you counted your scores up and looked at the key, and it says, you are, you know, you're not assertive enough if you've got a low score and you should so and so and so and so. Mm. There's, no, there's nothing in there about sort of 
discussion about how assertiveness is actually <laughs> uh, not, a, not seen as universally mm. a positive concept, but also, you know, how can you be assertive in different ways? What I might think is assertive behaviour may be different from what another person thinks is assertive behaviour. Right. The interesting about it was that even if you said, no, I wouldn't do these things, so one of the examples was, if someone was smoking in a public place, would you say anything to them? Mm. Okay. Even if you said no in the questionnaire, there was then role plays which followed, and you had to be assertive to someone who was smoking <laughs> in a public place. Right, so right. One, of, one of the things, it was sort of channeling, <laughs> channeling the response down. Mm. Okay, so I, I don't agree with that, but then we carry out the role play. Right. So, so these, these textbooks tended to um, require people to sort of use language as it fit in with a particular way of thinking about yeah. the world. Yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, one, one interesting, I mean, there's an interesting textbook uh, published some years ago, and I think it was called Across Cultures. I can't remember who the writer or the publisher was. And I was very interested because I picked it up, and I thought, oh, this sounds interesting, Across Cultures. Um, and there was one unit on Australia, actually, and here we're getting into critical literacy. Mm. Because the, the, the unit on Australia, you know, on Australia gave us a bit about the history of Australia and Captain Cook. And then it said that in this text, it was a reading comprehension and discussion, um, in the text it said that a lot of Aborigines died from diseases which had been brought by the Captain Cook and later settlers. Um, and in fact, I'd recently read a book by Robert Hughes called The Fatal Shore, which was a history of early Australia. Mm -hmm. And what was what was very interesting was that if you if you take Tasmania, for example, the major reason why Aborigines were killed in, in Tasmania, according to Robert Hughes, was because they were hunted like wild animals mm. by British officers. Now, <laughs> this raises very important questions. How do you represent history? <laughs> um, I could use that text by turning it critical. Mm. Now, uh, by saying, well, let's have a look at another perspective. Um, but the fact was, there wasn't within the textbook mm. the class or the text which would actually show a different perspective on that. Right. Um, I remember going, uh, also a similar thing, I remember going to a talk at a workshop at ITEF for many years ago, <coughs> and it talked about critical thinking. And I thought, well, this sounds interesting. And I went to the session, and I remember it quite well, many, many years ago now, but we were, we were given a short text, which was about the gold prospectors mm. in the Yukon Valley. And it was all about... And then we were asked to get together in groups and discuss how we could make, how we could bring critical thinking into this. Mm. So there was discussion. And I, I remember that I, I said, well, <clears throat> what I would do is give a text from the Native American Indians perspective who were thrown off the land, basically, mm. off the Indian reservations. But this, the presenter, was rather taken aback by this because <clears throat> I think what she was thinking about critical thinking was Bloom's taxonomy mm. of critical thinking skills. My idea of critical thinking was more the critical literacy, mm. okay, of showing the other perspective. And that got me thinking quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So critical literacy, um, for me, I mean, in today's world, and we all know what's happening um, in with a new president of the US, um, that the, the talk about representation in the media. Um, and for me, it seems to me that there's a great, great need for critical thinking and critical literacy, my idea of critical thinking. Mm. Right, right. Um, so <clears throat> I think the whole question, these terms such as critical literacy, critical thinking, are defined by different people in different ways. Mm. Um, and for me, um, a major part of being a teacher is to 
give both sides of the story. Right, right. And that's that's not necessarily going to be a, a comfortable position. Mm. When you're starting dealing with history, you're getting into very complex areas. Yeah. If you're starting dealing with, you know, colonialism and Cook going to Australia, etc., etc., what what else do you cover? Right. Well, you you've kind of touched on it a little bit already, but um, for a lot of teachers, course books are mandated. Yeah. You know, and that and deviation isn't really allowed. Mm. Um, I know this uh, from from my own experience as a, as yeah. a teacher. Um, often just being given a textbook and being told teach this yeah. cover to cover. Yeah. So what can teachers do in order to avoid some of these more problematic aspects of textbooks? Well, I think you can add, very, they, don't, they may not be adding very much, but adding an extra activity in, mm -hmm. which is actually asking students, well, who do you think the writer of this was? Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, you can take in, you can find a text which is slightly different. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're, if you're given a prescribed textbook to use, it's thinking about how you activate. I mean, you can see you can see two different lessons with the same material, which are completely different. Um, it may be that the teacher is grouping the, the students in a particular way, adding a, a task, adding an extra question to a reading comprehension activity or listening comprehension. Um, it might be something quite small. Um, Obviously, many teachers are in that situation. But I think also many teachers, once you become more experienced, do find ways of, you know, putting something in which is actually going to get students thinking about things. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex area. Um, in some countries, for example, the content is focused only on the country itself mm. or the culture of that country. You've then got another issue. You know, many countries are multicultural. <laughs> Whose culture do you focus on? Okay. Um, if you're learning English, how far can you deculturize it? I mean, some people say you can't. Mm. So, looking at textbooks published around the world, you'll see in some countries that the textbook is used in quite, you know, quite an overt way to promote perhaps the wrong word, but to try and reflect a positive image mm. of the country. Right. where the textbook is being used. And sometimes that's quite interesting. I mean, I, I remember seeing a textbook from Saudi Arabia, which made me think a little bit, because I remember in Headway, there was a unit in Headway, one of the first editions of Headway, it's probably intermediate or pre-intermediate, and it had a little grid, and it was about famous people and their inventions. Mm. And it was like a box, and you had... Byro, Hungarian, I can't remember all the different ones, but you had to link up mm -hmm. the invention with the inventor. Right. Or, and most of these were, were very well, European or American, mm. <laughs> for example. And um, I then remember seeing a Saudi Arabia book, which actually was quite interesting, because I learned actually quite a bit from it, because there was a bit which said, Many people say that Halley saw the comet in so so and so, but in mm. fact, before Halley saw it, was a famous Arabic mm. astronomer who'd actually seen it. Right. Okay, and so you, you're getting this sort of other version <laughs> of the world. You think actually, um, even that little that little change, mm. and bringing these sort of more international elements into the global text. But why why aren't these things in the global text? But why have you got Baro? you know, Hungarian, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, so it, it becomes very complex. Mm. So I think what tends to happen in the global textbook is that you think, well, there's so many 
issues which could be complex that I focus on shopping and talking about yourself and talking about safe safe things about mm. travelling um, what court textbook writers don't realise I think is that the way in which you talk about the things and the fact that you're asking to talk to students to talk about themselves the whole time is itself uh, perhaps culturally loaded right. uh, particular ways you're asking them to talk about themselves mm. uh, actually uh, in our interview with uh, Adrian Holiday conducted in this same building in fact, yes um, yeah he, he said that quite often uh, teachers will ask students to write about themselves or write about their culture, yeah. which um, he, he says is, is an act of like self-othering, mm. asking them to other themselves yeah. by simplifying yeah. Yeah, their, kind of, their cultural experience, I guess. Yes, I mean, obviously our ideas of culture, we're brought up in a, in a particular cultural context or possibly more than one. Mm when you start talking about small cultures, but, you know, social psychologists would say that we're very much, if you like, conditioned that our cultural models, um, our cultural scripts, that we learn particular cultural scripts, we have particular cultural models, we learn to favour the in-group, whatever in-group that may be, um, and therefore, our, when we're describing ourselves, we're tending to draw on those constructs. Mm. Right, right, right. Nice. Um, so maybe the, the final question. Um, for the people listening to this, yeah. um, the topics that we've been talking about today, can you recommend any, any further reading on those topics, if people want to go and explore for yeah. themselves? Well, John Gray has done a lot of work on um, critical perspectives in materials um, and John John's book on critical perspectives uh, published by Paul Grave I think has got some interesting chapters from different parts of the world there's also been work on intercultural communication uh, people like Liddy Cote who's written on intercultural communication there are quite a number of books coming out now um, one is on reflexivity in intercultural communication, uh, sorry, intercultural education and language education. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting, got an interesting mix of chapters. Um, so there are beginning to be a link also. I think of people like Liddy Coate and Fred Durden, for example, are exploring these links um, in very interesting ways. You mentioned. Um, Kanika Raja, mm. I, I would I think that you know he's working very much in those fields, and mm. also uh, Kumaravidelu. Mm. So I'm not sure if I quite said that. Yes, Kumaravidelu. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Everybody asks. Everybody says, "Call me Kumar." So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so um, I think he's doing some uh, some interesting work in the field of cultural issues and global issues in language education. So I think those people are good to go to. Mm. Um, I think the field of intercultural communication is a burgeoning one, and I think there's some very interesting uh, research being done. As far as language education is concerned, um, I still think there is a need for it to embrace issues of intercultural communication culture uh, in a more comprehensive way mm. because I still think it scratches the surface so you're getting festivals here what uh, one writer called about samosas, sorries and steel bands okay, mm. rather than having a real uh, in-depth uh, comprehensive view of it mm. Okay, well, thank you very much Okay, thank you Rob Thank you very much for listening today We'd also like to say thank you for John Coleman for his time. If you'd like to get in contact with us, please send us an email at teflology at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at teflology. Like us on Facebook. And please rate and review us on iTunes. You can also listen to older episodes at our website, www.teflology-podcast.com. And we'll be back again in two weeks.